story that we're used to to is hearing preach probably and we've read it many times and it's a great picture just a beautiful story beautiful example of how we're supposed to serve one another by uh by loving one another by caring for each other's needs uh doing something kind for them without expecting something in return you know these are all uh, things that we get from this passage of scripture now imagine the humility that jesus showed i mean here is the here's the lord of lords you know the he humbled himself to become a servant the bible says and so here he is on earth you know he knows who he is he knows he's the son of god he knows uh he'll be reigning for eternity uh he knows all those things and yet uh he's takes the time to go to his disciples and to actually wash their feet now, some people have read this and they've turned that into an ordinance in the church like foot washing you ever heard of a church that does foot washings uh we're not going to start that here okay <laughs> so, but uh you know, there's something about people's bunions and, and all that kind of stuff. Not so. <laughs> so would you do it? Well, sure. Sure, I would. I'd wash your feet if, if you were dying and sick and nobody else would do it. <laughs> but I'm just teasing. But the thing is, <laughs> no, I mean, I would do it. I'm just teasing about how bad it is. It's not that bad. <clears throat> I, I want to say some things, but I, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, uh, but imagine the humility that Jesus showed, you know, and, and, and so you can see why Peter would say, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Like, what are you thinking? Like, why don't you sit down and let me wash your feet, Jesus? But Jesus makes it very clear that he's trying to uh, set an example here. And, uh, and he says, no, no, no. He says, uh, you know, and Peter goes on and says, thou shalt never wash my feet. Of course, Peter was always a little overzealous. Like how many times in the Bible we see Jesus will say something and Peter will be like, not so, Lord. <laughs> like, are you arguing with the Lord? Right? But he thinks what he's doing is good. It's righteous. It's like, no, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wash your feet. You know, you shall, thou shalt never wash my feet. But in this message, I want to point out a second application that I see here that I think can, uh, can help us. All right, so knowing a little bit of the background of the story, I'm sure everybody is somewhat familiar uh, with it. We're going to look at a slightly different perspective. It's not changing the Word of God. I think it's very clear here. Uh, and, and then I'm going to bring this secondary application. Okay, so number one, application, what you might find hard to see in the text right away, but I'm going to bring it out here in a minute. Number one is this, we, meaning save people, okay, we are clean every wit. I tried to look up the etymology of the word wit, and apparently it has some association with the word white, and I have no idea why. <laughs> okay, but it means this basically, or like the white of an egg. Did you know that that's also called a wit? I didn't know that. <laughs> I don't understand. But here we know this in the Bible when it's used, it means like every part, you know, every, like the smallest part of something, like every single bit. And he says that, uh, and, and so there's an application here where Jesus is saying that, uh, that saved people are clean every whit. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 8. <clears throat> let's go, to, let's, yeah, start in verse 8. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answering, and answered him, saying, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. <laughs> okay, now see how the attitude of, of Peter changes. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> you, see what, you see what he's saying? He's like, he's, he's rebuking him, he's scolding him, and he's saying, like, if you don't let me wash your feet, then I got no part with you. And he's like, okay, well then, and that, by that, you know, by that token, wash my hands and my, my face and, and everything, because I want to be completely yours, you know. So I, don't, I think in his zeal, I think he really had a righteous desire, uh, you know, to serve the Lord and be loved by the Lord. But Jesus saith unto him this, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore, saith he, ye are not all clean. Now, it might be a little tricky here, but if you, if you kind of put it all together and you read a little bit about Judas and you understand that Judas was never saved, okay, he just hung out with them. He stayed among them. Uh, you know, he... He held the bag, which means he must have been somewhat trustworthy. 
And, uh, you know, whenever they, uh, somebody would lavish upon the Lord and they break open some expensive ointment or something like that, he'd be like, hey, we should have given that to the poor. And the Bible says he didn't say that because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. So he's just there pretending to be something that he's not. He wasn't saved. He definitely wasn't saved. And once we are saved, uh, I believe that there's an application here where Jesus is saying, hey, you are, you are completely clean. You are, uh, you are saved. Now, notice this. When he begins talking to him, uh, where was that again? Verse 8. When he begins talking to him, he says, uh, let's see, verse, verse 10, actually. Whenever he responds, he says this. He that is washed needeth not to save uh, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. So this is singular. Okay, so talking about every, every person. Um, every person need not. Uh, he that is washed. Okay, that's one person. Needeth not save to wash his feet. Is singular, but is clean every whit. And then he says, "And ye are clean." Now, what does that? What's ye mean? Well, ye's plural. Okay, a lot of people are like, oh, these and thous and the yees and the, you know, we just need to get rid of that from the King James because it's too confusing. No, it actually helps you make, make sense out of the passage because if, otherwise you don't know if it's singular or plural. Okay, so anytime you see it's, uh, ye or you, something that starts with Y, your, uh, that's going to be plural. And anything that starts with TH, thee, thine, thou, is going to be singular, okay, depending on the uh, co the context, which one to use, but that's that's pretty much a... a, a you know, so, and I didn't even learn this till I was like part, I was like almost all the way through Bible college. And it's not that maybe it was taught to me and I just didn't pay attention or something like that. But whenever that stuck with me, I was like, wow, that really changes the way that I read the Bible because I understand the what's singular and what's plural. You know, the first one that jumped out to me whenever I learned that was whenever Jesus tells Nicodemus, marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. So he's like, I'm talking to you, but I'm talking about everybody's got to be born again for the, in, in order for them to be saved. And that was the first time I noticed that difference. And I'm like, oh, wow. And then like, I just started learning like singular and plural. Why didn't anybody ever tell me that? You know, you need to know what the these and the thous and the yees and, and all that. Are. So here he's saying uh, singular, he that is he, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And then he says plural. And ye are clean, but not all. And so what he's doing is saying, you know, you, you guys, my disciples here, you're clean. You don't need to, for me to wash your, your hands and your face and all that kind of stuff, just your feet. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. But he said, you're clean because you're clean every whit. Like you're, you're completely clean. He said, except for one of you. And then it says, because he knew Judas would betray him and he knew that he was a devil and all those kinds of things uh, that we put two and two together from Scripture regarding Judas. But he said, but for the rest of you, you know, this is what he's saying, is that you are clean every whit. Let me read you a couple passages of Scripture here that show you this. If you are saved, you're clean every whit. It's hard to imagine uh, how somebody in their wickedness, you know, committing sin, doing different things, uh, how they can be righteous and can be clean, but they are. And in the Bible, when you see God talking about somebody, like even Lot, I mean, the story, to, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about the life of Lot, but the parts that he does tell us, we're like, that's not a clean guy. But yet God calls him just. And he says his righteous soul was vexed. And so here's a man that God considers to be clean. And, uh, and, and really, we understand that from Scripture, but at the same time, uh, sometimes it's hard to, hard to understand that when you're reading. And uh, even I was thinking about when, I don't write it down, but when Jesus says, uh, you know, he's going to tell those people uh, uh, on the right hand, he's going to say, hey, you know, you, you love me and you took care of me. I'm, I'm totally paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact phrase. And he says, uh, he says, and well, you gave me water when I was thirsty and you gave me. And they said, when did we do that? And he says, you know, whatever you did to the least of these, you did unto me. And then he talks to the other ones and he says, hey, you didn't do this. And I remember, you know, people get confused on that and they read that and they say, well, see, it's all about works. You got to do the works. And this group here, they did the works. And so they get to go to heaven and these didn't do the work. So they have to go to hell. And then some people said, no, we don't believe that. We believe you go to heaven by grace. And so they said, well, it's just a different dispensation. Like, you know, we don't go to hell for that. But in the, you know, after the tribulation, then those people who are judged according to their works. And so some go to hell. That's, this is what they teach because they say, no, there's no way that we could. Here's what I think. I think that he's just saying he's identifying Christians 
just expecting that the Christians do good works. Because guess what? When we stand before God as Christians in final judgment, He doesn't even look at our sins. You know, he judges us based on the works that we did for Christ, and He rewards us for those works. But He doesn't even judge us according to our sin because that's already gone. Our body, once our body perishes, you know, we're in heaven, and we're only rewarded for the works that we did. I'm not going to take time to prove that, but I mean, I, I can prove that from the Bible. And so I think He's just lumping everybody in. And he's saying, hey, this group of people here, you did good works, you helped people, you know, you did all these, all these wonderful, wonderful things. And to this other group, he's saying, you didn't do these things. And I think he's just saying, hey, you know, when you judge this group, and this is something I talked about this morning a little bit about the first resurrection, second resurrection, those people who are involved in the second resurrection, they are raised after the thousand year reign of Christ, they are raised up to stand before the final judgment of God. And he judges them according to their works. He says, man, you are some wicked people. You know, you, and, and he just like all the negative, he doesn't even see the good. It's almost like the opposite. You know, with the wicked crowd, I mean, with the unsaved crowd, he sees their wickedness, doesn't see their good. With the saved crowd, he sees their good and doesn't see their wickedness. I mean, it's kind of like the judgment uh, is, is like that. And so that's what, I, that's what I think, okay? But it's hard to imagine that because in our in our minds, we just see, hey, that person is good, that person's bad. And this is why people get totally confused on, on works in regards to their salvation. Well, let me read a couple of things here. Jeremiah 50, 20 says, In those days, this is prophetic, okay? And in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for. And, it's, and I don't want to get into the whole lot of doctrine here, but the Iniquity of Israel at this point is talking about God's people, okay, which I believe includes all God's people. And the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Okay, so God, you know, if you're looking for sins, I remember one time I had this, uh, I may have shared this with you before, but one time I had this idea for a short story. And I probably shouldn't tell you because somebody, somebody listen on live stream and they'll steal this and they'll make a million dollars off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I had this idea for a short story where somebody is reading in the Bible. And, because, and the reason why is because I was doing this. At this time, I was studying the life of David. And I was like, man, David, I hate the way he treated Michael. And I hate how he did to Phaleel, I think is the name of Michael's uh, uh, husband. And, uh, and he did this. And you're, how about Bathsheba? And then he killed Uriah. And I was thinking all these things. And I picture this person who was saved and goes up to heaven and is like, hey, when I get to heaven, you know, I'm going to uh, really address this issue. And I'm going to confront David. And then he gets to heaven and he sees at the table it's just totally fictitious, okay? Just my weird mind. And he sits at the table, and, it, and David's like sitting right next to Uriah and sitting right next to Bathsheba and sitting right next to, uh, you know, Faltiel and, <laughs> and all these people. And the guy's like perplexed. Of course, this wouldn't happen because he would be in a perfect body as well. But he's perplexed, and he goes to them. He goes to my call, and he says, why are you sitting next to him? The way he treated you in this life? And she's like, what are you talking about? And all she can remember about David is like, this is a guy that killed the giant and said, you know, is there not a cause? And he did all these things. And, and then he said, well, well, but Faltiel, like he took, and then he's like, what are you talking about? David was just the most merciful person. And all they can see is like the good works that David did on this, on this life. He can't even, they can't even see the, uh, the bad works. Anyway, that's kind of a weird thing. But in a way, that's what I read in, the, in, in some of these verses. He's like, you know, you'll look for iniquity and it won't even be found. For I will pardon them whom I reserve. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. How many times have we heard that verse used for people that say, see, you got to repent of your sins because once you're saved, like you're just, you're totally repentant and you're like this new creature. But what happens two days from now, whenever you sin again, it's like, oh man, I need to become a new creature again. He's not taught the new creature is the inward man. See, the, the outward creature, now hopefully his life changes. Hopefully once you get saved, you want to serve the Lord and you go to church and you do all those things. But the new creature is the inward man. This is the part of you that's saved. This is the part of you that can't sin. So when Paul says, hey, if I sin, I mean, if I uh, do the things that I don't want to do, it's not me that sins anymore, but it's the sin that's in me. You say, well, well that's a convenient excuse. It's just the reality. The, uh, the true us, once we're saved, is perfect. It's clean every whit. And it goes to heaven, and, uh, and God looks at it as righteousness because it's covered through the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, He paid for all those sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus, from what he, because of what He did, 
God now looks at us and sees the righteousness of Christ. We're made righteous in Him. Now that sounds like, oh man, you're just giving an excuse to just go live however you want. No, if you live however you want in this life, you're going to pay for it. You know, you live in however you want in this life, God's going to chasten you uh, because He wants you in this life to uh, learn some valuable lessons and to live for Him and be fruitful and produce fruit and get people saved and do all these, uh, these things for Him in this life, which also incidentally is going to lay up treasures in heaven that you'll experience in the, uh, in, in the second life. Okay, so the first point here is that people who are saved are clean every whit. All right. Now, number two, we still need to have our feet washed. <laughs> okay. And again, the illustration is going to break down a little bit, but this is the point I think is clear that uh, that Jesus is is saying. Okay. So he says, "Hey, you don't have to." What verse was that again? Verse nine. Uh, no, no, verse ten. Jesus said, "He that is washed needeth." not save to wash his feet. All right, so save means, you know, except for this, like only except for this. He, he doesn't need to be washed save to wash his feet, but he's clean every whit, and ye are clean but not all. So here's a picture that I get in my head. Say you just got done taking a shower or a bath or whatever, and you're nice and you're clean. Excuse me, I'm going to get a water here. And, uh, and this is a scenario that I'm sure a lot of us can, can relate to. And so you get out of the shower and then you're like, oh man, I forgot my phone's on the charger in the car. Something that happens to me quite a bit. But I'm already, I'm already take, I've already taken a shower, but I don't want to put my shoes on. And so I just walk out to the car barefoot, except that it just rained. And so now on my way out to the car, I'm squashing through the mud. And when I come back, I got muddy feet. Wouldn't it be kind of silly for me to be like, oh man, I got to take a shower again. <laughs> and so I go jump in the shower to clean my feet. Uh, no, that's the, the, the picture is, hey, you, you're already washed, you're already clean, but you got a little dirt on your feet, you just got to take care of that. Does that make sense? Like, obviously, again, the illustration would break down if you're looking, hey, I thought we didn't have any sin in Christ. Yeah, but the point is, like in this life, we need to address sin in our life. Even though God sees us as clean, even though we're going to heaven, we still need to address the dirty feet, okay? Uh, because the dirty feet are going to uh, cause, cause problems, okay? And this is a great picture of why we need to still ask forgiveness, you know, because it's like, well, I thought I was already forgiven. Now, let me tell you another verse that a lot of people misunderstand, First, First John chapter 1. First John chapter one, look at verse eight. Now, right up, right from the beginning. I mean, this is the first chapter, and if you read the very first couple uh, verses, it's clear that he's talking to Christians. All right, these things write I unto you, and he's talking about Christians, those who have fellowship with the Son, of, uh, with the Son Jesus Christ. And so, anyway, here's what he says in verse six: If we say we have, uh, uh, I'm sorry, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now you say, well, wait a minute, but I thought we didn't have sin. Yeah, the, the inward man, the new creature is sinless, but he's talking to Christians who are living in this flesh and who are dealing with sin on a regular basis. And he says, if we uh, say that we don't have sin, which by the way, there's a lot of people that say that. And it's like, you look at him like, you really trying to convince me that you have no sin? <laughs> it's bizarre, you know, but that's what people say. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, he, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, some people will take this as a salvation verse and they'll say, see, if you confess your sins... He's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all righteousness. And so let's say, well, how do you get saved? Well, you just got to ask God forgiveness for your sins. Not exactly. I mean, that's, that's part of like admitting you're a sinner, saying, oh man, I deserve to go to hell. I need forgiveness of my sins. I mean, that's part of salvation. But really, if a person just said, oh, you know what? I'm going to go to the priest then. I'm going to say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to confess all my sins and he's going to forgive me of my sins. I mean, I mean, no, that's not it. So you say, okay, well, I have to go to God and I had to ask him forgiveness for his sins. Well, first of all, you have to be his child or else he's not even listening to you. You know what I mean? Now, 
in God's foreknowledge, I realize that he listens to people before they're saved, knowing that they're going to get saved, however that plays out. Okay, To the unsaved who never get saved, he's like, I never knew you. But to those who are going to get saved someday, I do believe that he uh, has that communication with them before they ever get saved. It's kind of a weird situation. Uh, I don't know how to explain it exactly, but I do believe that that happens. In his foreknowledge, he knows that they're going to get saved. Okay, so, uh, but uh, where was I got kind of off track? Anybody remember what I was saying? So I was in First John. Okay, so <laughs> so here's the deal. Uh, so, but if you, uh, I, I, I turned my place, that's why. So, but if, so people will say you need to confess your sins uh, in order to get God's forgiveness. But the thing is, you know, doesn't he know if we're sorry for our sins or not? Doesn't he know if we want, you know, and the way that we get forgiveness isn't actually by how we pray or how sorrowful we are or anything like that. How do we get forgiveness to Jesus Christ? The first time, the first time, once and for all, how do we get forgiveness? We put our faith in Jesus Christ, right? And we trust in him and we call on the name of the Lord and we get saved. And once we're saved, we're in Christ, we're new creatures, we're spotless, we're clean every whit, remember? Okay, so uh, so actually they're taking this verse out of context when they say that because it does it is true that we're supposed to confess our sins, but he's talking to saved people. So the idea is once you're saved, you're in Christ, but on this earth, you're going to have to wash those feet. You're going to have to go ahead and ask God to forgive you whenever you fall into sin. You didn't lose your salvation. You can't ever lose your salvation. But you might have messed up your life. You might have lost some rewards. You might have hindered some things that God wanted to do through you or whatever the case. And so you go and you ask forgiveness and it says, He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Incidentally, the Bible says that all manner of sin shall be forgiven except for the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, okay? Which I believe ultimately just means those who would reject the pricking of the Lord for somebody, you know, to, rec to, uh, to need, that needs to be saved. And whenever Christ is preached, right, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. When Christ is preached, the Holy Spirit begins to prick hearts. And when re they reject that, I believe that that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I have to preach a whole message on that passage to show you why I believe that. But, uh, uh, but, you know, he does convict the hearts and, uh, and he does uh, forgive us of our sins whenever we, uh, whenever we uh, call, I mean, whenever we come to him. All right, so 1 John 1, 8, 9. Now, let me move to the last point here, which is this. So we, we're clean every whit, except that from time to time our feet get dirty and we need to wash our feet, okay? Now, the third point is this. Go back to John uh, go back to our text, John 13, look at verse 14. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Now, I'm not making light of the fact that Jesus is certainly setting an example that we should serve one another. Okay, do good things for each other without expecting things in return. I mean, there's so many applications you can take from this. But the application that I'm resting on here is that just like Jesus is saying, hey, I need to wash your feet because your feet are dirt, your feet are dirty, we need to wash one another's feet. Keeping in mind all the things that I just told you about, you know, hey, you're clean every whit, uh, but some of you aren't, uh, but, but your feet need to be washed or whatever. Well, according to the Bible, we also have a responsibility to make sure one another's feet are clean, okay? And so with this illustration in mind, think about when your brother has dirty feet, I'm not trying to be silly, but it's, it, when they have dirty feet, it affects everybody, all right? How many times does somebody walk in, let's take that situation where they walked out to the car, got their feet muddy, even though their whole body's clean, uh, but they got the feet dirty, and then they come back in the house, what are they doing? They're tracking mud all through the carpet. What do you think mama's going to do? What do you think, you know, your, your, the family's going to do? Like, hey, hey, what are you doing? Your feet are dirty. You know, they might not even know that their feet are dirty. But they're going to uh, they're going to be causing, you know, problems for other people. They're going to be an embarrassment to all. They're going to be offended, offending guests. All right. Uh, people who aren't part of the part of the family, you know, hey, we don't want you to be going around here uh, dirtying up the carpet and having having nasty feet. So this is why it's important to wash one another's feet. Again, 
it could be that they don't even know that their feet are dirty. This is, this is a common thing, okay? When it comes to judging, which I'm going to end here in a minute with, this, with the passage about judging, okay? When it comes to judging, uh, the reason that we have to go ahead and tell people about their sins whenever we recognize them and we have to try to get those dealt with and not, you know, pass them up or, or just kind of brush them under the table or anything like that is because it could be that they don't even know that they have that they have that sin or they don't or maybe they know they have that sin, but they don't know it's affecting anybody else. And so we have to make sure that we uh, go to that person and let them know. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Starting in verse 15. Moreover, and this is Jesus speaking to the disciples. You know, this is the start of the church. Uh, basically, it's just him and his disciples and those who are following him around. Later on, after he ascends up into heaven, he'll leave uh, the, the church to be started there under the leadership of Peter and those who would come up after him. Moreover, if, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Okay, so first thing you do is go to that person in private because they might not know that what they're doing is wrong. And you bring that out. And if they say, well, I disagree or I'm going to do it anyway, then you can bring it before others. And then you bring it before the whole church so that that can be dealt with. So the person doesn't continue living in sin and, uh, and be an embarrassment and leave the footprints on the carpet, so to speak, and, and be offensive and all those kinds of things. And so we're actually doing it for the whole family. That's why we would wash one another's uh, feet. Now, in this illustration, the Judases, now the problem with the Judases is you usually don't know that they're there. I mean, all the uh, disciples, they didn't even know that he was, you know, until afterwards. They didn't, even whenever he's like getting ready to uh, betray the Lord, I mean, so much so, uh, this is what always perplexed me. Like, they're like, they're like, who is it? Who's going to betray you? And he's like, it's him who dips the sop, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then like Judas then dips his bread in the sop and like, they still don't seem to know. They still don't understand it. He goes out and they're like, oh, I guess he went to go buy more bread or so, or whatever the, the case is. And so, you know, it's not like everybody knew Judas was a bad guy. You know, they just, they just didn't know. So most of the time, you'll never recognize a Judas. But if you do know a Judas, somebody who's not saved, they're preaching false gospel, uh, they're trying to pretend to be something they're not, they're that kind of like wolf in sheep's, clo sheep's clothing that, you, uh, that we read about, that person, once they're discovered, they need to be kicked out. Uh, you know, if they're not going to get saved and they're not going to, uh, uh, you, you know, if, if they're going to continue to be that person, they need to be kicked out if it's even possible to spot them, which is probably not. But our brothers and sisters in Christ, when they have dirty feet, they just need to get those feet washed. Now look at Matthew chapter 7, and I'll close with this. It's going to be a short message. Matthew chapter 7, the famous... Verse, most quoted verse, probably in all the Bible, right? The most loved verse by the world. Judge not that you be not judged. How many times have you heard that? Judge not. Judge not that you be not judged. But the, Jesus goes on to say this. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Uh, okay, so what is he talking about here? So when it comes to dealing with our brothers' and sisters' sins, you know, when it comes to washing their feet, so to speak, 
They're not saved. We're, you know, we understand they're saved. We're not saving their souls as far as their eternal souls, uh, but we might be saving them from some damage and destruction uh, that might happen to them. But the first thing we need to do before we go about trying to clean someone else's feet is consider our own feet, right? Or in this case, the be the beam that's in our eyes. You know, we need to remove that before we can see clearly to help them remove the moat that's in, in, in their eye. So the first thing we need to do is consider our own selves. Okay, we, uh, it's, it's crucial, but it's hard. It's really hard. It's so easy to see other people's sins, so hard to see our own sins. And even if we do see our own sins, it's hard to put the same judgment upon them. We don't think ours is as bad. You know, ours should be forgiven, but someone else's, hey, that's too bad. And so uh, this is the reality of it. And so the first thing we need to do is make sure that we're right uh, in, our own, in our own selves. And if we are, well, then by all means, you do what you can to help to remove that, that beam from your brother. Okay, so work on yourself before judging others. Then, how do you go about doing the judgment, removing the, the beam, so to speak? Then, humbly approach those who need your help. And I say humbly because, obviously, you know, that's still part of somebody who has humbled themselves and, re and removed the beam out of their own eye. You know, that's a humbling experience. And so now as you're trying to help somebody else, it's like, hey, man, I'm not saying I've arrived. I'm not, I'm not saying be uh, superficial, not to have a false modesty or false humility. Uh, but it is true. You got to have that attitude that's like, you know, hey, I'm not perfect. I'm just trying to help you. I'm not trying to judge you because, you know, uh, I hate you or something like that. But let me let me offer some advice where I can help you in this area. That's that's the right kind of judgment. That's the right. And let me show you what the Bible says. And then ultimately, God becomes the judge. Right. We're not even judging people at that point because it's like, well, here's what the Bible says you got to do in this situation. But it would be hypocritical to be living in sin and then be like, let me show you what the Bible says. And then you're telling people how to deal with something that you're just as guilty of, uh, uh, of doing. If it's God's judgment, God's advice, it's still good, but you don't want to give it hypocritically. All right, now look at Jude. The book of Jude, this is the last passage. And then, of course, in that analogy that not analogy, but in that uh, example that Jesus gives in Matthew 7, I'm not in Matthew 7, Matthew 18, where he talks about going first privately to your brother and then taking another person with you and then ultimately bringing before the church. Uh, you know, there does come a time, you notice where you got to be kind of harsh with somebody because in this case, you know, this is somebody who they refuse to listen to anybody and then they get involved in whatever sin there comes a time to say, hey, treat them as a heathen and a publican. I mean, you know, just, you, you know, not treat them like your brother anymore. You're casting them out of the assembly or whatever. Okay, Jude, Jude uh, look at verse 21, only one chapter. So verse 21. Now notice this because this is a passage of scripture that, again, I feel like we, we quote a little out of context because I often use this as a soul winning verse. And it's all right. I don't think, I think it still is a, is a good example, a good uh, illustration to use. But I actually think he's talking about Christians. And let me show you why. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Who's he talking to? Christians. And he's talking about keeping one another in uh, the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Okay, that's, that should be the goal. But when they won't receive that compassion and they won't be brought back in love and compassion, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. There comes a time where you're rough with somebody because they're not accepting the, the, the weight and the gravity of their sin. And so you get a little bit uh, rough with them. And this is, this is uh, what would happen. If somebody said, hey, I just, took a, <laughs> I just took a shower, I'm not dirty. Well, you're leaving footprints on the ground. Can't you see? Stop for a minute and look. You know how many parents have to kind of get a little aggressive with your kids every once in a while? Not because you don't love them, because they're not listening. Okay. And so this is the idea about harsh judgment that sometimes has to come on people, uh, but it's because they continue to be involved or to live in some kind of a sin. 
All right, so anyway, this is just a great application, I think, that we can get from this passage of Scripture beside the just general one of, hey, serving one another and loving one another and do nice things for them. Uh, but I don't think we have to have this ordinance either about going around and literally washing people's feet. Uh, but at the same time, I think another, this is an illustration that we can get that we need to, first of all, you know, have our own feet washed. And uh, by the way, how do you get your own feet washed? You go to Jesus, right? Jesus is the one who's washing feet in this story. And he's the one that will clean your feet. Just like he's the one that saved you, he's the one that's going to help you in this life to, uh, to get through this life and try to be spotless as much as possible when you're presented to the Lord. Okay, and then, uh, and then we also need to do the best we can to keep one another uh, from having the dirty feet, so to speak. Let's pray. Lord, I pray uh, that you'll help us as a church, first and foremost, to just uh, recognize you as the supreme authority and fear you adequately as we ought to because uh, you are the final judge, final say. I also pray that you'll help us to, um, in humility, uh, recognize uh, that, that we have sin in our life that we need to deal with and then also to recognize sins in our brothers' and sisters' lives that we might be able to help them with. Help us to do that humbly, uh, aggressive when we need to be aggressive, but help us to uh, ultimately have your judgments and your word and what you've told us to do uh, be our final authority and not just what we feel in our hearts and in our with our emotions, uh, but what we get from the knowledge of your word. I pray that you'll help us to do that and you'll bless this church accordingly according to your will. We look forward to that. We have faith that you will do that. And I uh, pray you bless the rest of this uh, this night. Anybody going out soul winning, Lord, I pray that you'll uh, help them to be bold and to uh, uh, be thorough in their presentation of the gospel, Lord, that we might see some receive Christ today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.